Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the library at Calvary Road Baptist Church. I'm the pastor for 35 and a half years of Calvary Road Baptist Church, and uh, this is my home away from home. This is my library. Uh, we are located in the city of Monrovia, California. Monrovia is located uh, a few miles northeast uh, of Los Angeles in the, in the gulag known as Los Angeles County. Uh, we're in the south end of the People's Republic of California. Uh, Los Angeles County is the largest county by population in the United States. Just south of us is Orange County, which is the third largest county by population in the United States. And then San Diego County is the fifth largest county by population in the United States of America. So we've got a lot of people close by here. There's an awful lot of people to reach out to and seek to minister to. And um, I'm glad that you are here. This is Zoom session number 77, if I recall correctly. And this evening, uh, I'm going to interview uh, one of the missionaries that our church has supported for a number of years. And uh, back in the day, I knew his mother and his father when we and my wife were members of Bethany Baptist Church in Whittier, California. And I maintain some Facebook relationships with people who were members of Bethany Baptist Church back in the day. But uh, his father um, was a young man who had just graduated from Long Beach State University. And um, he had eyes for the church secretary. Um, and her name was Hope. And uh, they ended up, uh, uh, Dustin's father was called to the gospel ministry. His mother had already been to Bible college. Uh, but he went, he ended up going to the same college that I did, and then they went uh, and got married, and they have been on the mission field of Chile for all of these years from that time until now, and so um, I have known Dustin's mother and father longer than I have known him, but I had the privilege uh, when I was teaching in, in a Bible college of, uh, of uh, teaching a class that he took. And uh, that was when I first had an opportunity to meet with him. Our church has been a supporter of his uh, ministry, um, I think just about from the beginning, but he will be able to, uh, to clarify. Missionaries keep track of things like that better than old pastors do. And so without further ado, let me bring him in. This is missionary to Chile, Dustin Reinhardt. So thank you so much, Dr. Walter, for those kind words. It's a privilege and an honor to be part of this missions conference, this missions inferences, and to be part of your church. Uh, as you mentioned, Calvary Road Baptist Church has been one of those first supporting churches. And to be honest, Dr. Waldrop has been the person who's emailed me the most from all the pastors that I have. So pastor has a very special um, part in my heart in ministry. He, he taught me public speaking in Bible college. So anything that goes wrong at this point on, you know who to blame. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. I take full responsibility. So uh, we're doing this obviously because of the current COVID situation. Uh, we'd much rather have you and your wife and daughters here, but uh, that's not possible under current circumstances. So I'd like for us just to kind of go through this, and a number of our newer church members have not met you. Uh, I remember the last time you and your wife and daughters were with us, and Daniel and his wife and kids, we went to um, Rudy's uh, Mexican restaurant, and when we came out of the restaurant, Elon Musk had just launched uh, a satellite into space, if you'll recall that, and the, and the way the sky lit up at night, it was almost like the apocalypse, because uh, it was weird, it was, it was very unusual, and, uh, and that was a memorable time, and I think it was, was, uh, was Mata's uh, mother also with us, um, Daniel's mother-in-law, I think she might have been with us on that occasion or another. But uh, we're glad to have you here. So what I'd like to do is just kind of go through a, a little of a sequence 
And, and if you would, would you just, uh, um, because you're, you, you fit into the pattern of our church uh, and our missions outreach. I arrived at a conclusion, oh, several decades ago that most of the missionaries sent out from the United States had benefited from the superpower status of the United States and missionaries in other countries were treated at least deferentially and respectfully by those foreign countries, and not necessarily because they liked the United States and not necessarily because they liked the missionaries, but out of a little bit of uh, concern because you don't want to be at cross purposes with the world's superpower. And you had to choose sides back in those days. Um, it's getting to the place where you're gonna to have to choose sides again, but for, uh, for a number of years, I, I, have, uh, I have felt that um, uh, someone who needs to learn the language and learn the culture is at about a decade or two disadvantage from someone like you who was born and raised on the mission field. And there are certain things that you know about missions work, being, being the son of your mom and dad. And there's things that you know about the culture that, uh, that missionaries born and reaching adulthood in the United States may not ever learn. And so you have, you have in my view, uh, a decided advantage when it comes to that. And so uh, tell us, you were, you were born in Chile, but get us from, from there up until the time perhaps um, your upbringing and reaching adulthood. Yeah, uh, absolutely, uh, Dr. Waldrip. It's, I was reading the preface of your book. I was scamming through it as a reminder. And there's a lot of things of your story that I feel very identified with, being an outsider looking in. In my case, the outside looking in was not being raised in Chile, looking towards the Chilean culture, but actually coming back to the States at age 18 and trying to figure out all of the different cultural differences you have here in the US. But uh, as you mentioned, I was born in, in Chile, South America and the city of La Serena. Spanish is my first language and I will be a little bit rusty this evening I speak Amy because it's evening here, it's midday over there. Um, but culturally speaking, I, I, I have that advantage of being reared in a Chilean public school system, going to a Chilean church um, that was pastored, that was actually started by my father. And I had this dual, dual culture. Uh, I think the, the terminology is third culture where you're not 100% Chilean, you're not 100% American, you're a hybrid between both worldviews. And growing up in Chile, it really marked a big difference, seeing the lack of gospel preaching churches, that when I surrendered my life to the ministry at age 12, I went to youth camp, and I remember that starry night, and I was moved by the preaching of the speaker that evening, my surrendering was basically, God, do whatever you want with my life. In high school, I, I was getting very good grades. I, I had a lot of different opportunities and options to study, and, and everything was very promising. But coming to the States, coming to the U.S., I, I realized that the need was still great in the mission field. And that's going to be part of the reason why, and we'll talk about the call in, in a minute, um, why I, I, went, I came back to Chile. I was very comfortable in the States. I was working at a church. I had a very nice salary. I had a nice apartment. I had the American dream when it comes to being an associate pastor. But there was that void inside of me that needed to come back to reach the people that needed the gospel. So that's a little bit of my my background, I, I, I went to high school in Chile and by age 18, my parents came back in a furlough and um, they, were, they were in the States for about two months and then I was ready to 
venture into the world by myself. <laughs> well, I have been kind of getting ready for talking to you. I've looked at some uh, at YouTube videos and I've kind of refreshed my um, uh, appraisal of Chile from, from an American perspective. But um, I first took notice of um, Chile uh, when Allende was overthrown by Pinochet and, and I remember some American missionaries in Chile uh, were not at all shy about which side they were on. And it was very, very offensive to many Chileans for a foreigner to be so decidedly on one side of an issue that wasn't really necessarily all of their business. Um, but Chile is, is, is I think, um, Reinhardt fits into the country because there's an awful lot of Europeans there, um, and 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 Chile is a is a rising star in Latin America. It's got a very very strong culture, very advanced, uh, tremendous educational system. Uh, um, it's it's uh, one of the uh, the richest countries on the planet with regard to minerals and mining and all that kind of stuff. I'm guessing it would be. It would be Australia and Chile and and uh, and probably South Africa would be among the top three or four countries in the world for for mining, and so um, I, I I just felt like um, um, a missionary in Chile uh, might I would I would envision occupying a bit of a delicate situation because the the way the country responded to what's called the Chicago School of Economists. Um, I don't think they had anything to do with what Pinochet was doing, but they got a, they got closely associated with him, um, and so the there was a wariness of American involvement in their culture and society that I'm not sure an. Uh, and I, I don't refer to you as an American missionary. You're a Chilean missionary, in my mind, uh, that you would be able to appreciate the nuances uh, far more than someone who was learning A, the language, learning B, the culture. Uh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and you brought up some very fascinating topics that when it comes to history and politics, I really enjoy it, but I'm very, very cautious with what I say from the pulpit or what I speak with the Chilean nationals, because even though, and, and I'm not sure if I'm going to be shooting myself in the foot right now, if any of my Chilean friends will be listening to this eventually, but when it comes to the communist party that was happening under Allende, th there were American missionaries that were targeted to disappear. And... Pinochet came, and when they went through the records, some of those missionary names were in that hit list. Some yeah. of our, our missionaries that we, we know. And therefore, at a big picture, at a big picture, he brought capitalism back, which is the reason why you have the thriving economy, the stability, and all of the benefits with it. Even the last year, we had major riots um, for social injustice and a lot of things that were being bombarded from, from other governments. But the reason why it's such a controversial issue is because there were a lot of people that were tortured and disappeared. And that brings a very emotional aspect towards the national. So I work within a social class in Chile um, we are in the poorest city in all of north of Chile. And as you understand, communism is very popular towards the, the lower class um, social, social status. Therefore, it makes it a lot <clears throat> harder issue to even address. But as you mentioned, um, German. German for the longest time was the second most spoken language in Chile because of the South. And because of that presence in the South, when Chileans see me here in the North, they, they don't think I'm an American missionary because I speak perfect Spanish. They think I'm a Southerner. I'm, yeah, I'm from yeah. the way South. And my, my, my mother's maiden name was Schwenke. 
and there's Schwenkies in the south of Chile. So they just add one plus one and, and it, it opens up some, some doors, but um, definitely understanding what to say and what not to say has saved me a lot of headaches when it comes to reaching people with the gospel. So yeah, yeah. I, would, I would agree with, with that benefit. And, and, and I give grace to God, I, I give thanks to God because he has given us this, these tools. My wife also being a, a Chilean national, sometimes I have to ask her for the deep, deep Chilean understanding that not even I know <laughs> because she has some other upbringings. Therefore, it's really helpful. Yes, yes. So how are, are your wife and, and children doing these days? I would say they're surviving. <laughs> I have three young girls, ages nine, seven, and six. Time flies. That's how, that's how far. We, we had only one baby shower when my wife was pregnant with Emma, and it was at Calvary Road Baptist Church. And I still have those pictures. Uh, it's been nine years. And being confined, COVID has, has hit very hard, chilly, not because of fatalities, but because of the restrictions. Yeah. So we were in phase one of five phases where you're not allowed to exit your house unless you have, you get two times a week for two hours to go shopping to the supermarket and back. That's all you get if you're not of urgent necessity. And having three young girls in a small confined area can be a little bit challenging. My wife as well, um, she was able to go in and, and she had to do a, an emergency visit at, at this point. There's a lady in the church whose father has COVID and uh, they don't live together, but this lady had her mother pass away three weeks ago. So she's, she's interacting with that at this point. Now, this, uh, do Chileans, um, do they value their daily trip to the to the fresh market the way the Brazilians and the Argentines do? Where, where you're gonna, you get your meat and you wanna go to the market and get it every day. So this, this confining is, a, is a, probably much more brutal for Chileans than it is for Americans who don't have to go to the market every day as a, as a cultural requirement. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Now, now there, there are different social classes and the upper class, they like to go to the highest expensive supermarket. But when it comes to the middle class, um, they have different farmers with uh, farmer markets. The main one is called the Quebradilla. And it's a, it's a place with thousands of, of people that interact, but it's all been shut down for at least eight months. They were shut down for six straight months. They gave us one month. And now we've been confined for another month and hopefully this coming Monday we'll be passing to phase two that allows us liberty between or freedom to, to travel between Monday through Friday. That's great. But it has been, it has been very detrimental for the economy. So when you came to the US at the age of 18, how long were you here and what did you do while you were here? Well, my main focus was going to Bible college and then go back as a missionary as quickly as possible. So I, I arrived at age 18, I finished high school and I, I attended Pacific Baptist College that used to be in Pomona. I guess it's in Laverne today for um, since 2005, I graduated 2009 and I did my internship in a church uh, in Southern California called Brea Baptist Church in the city of Brea. And I was there for an additional three or four years under the, the leadership of uh, Pastor Dave Rader, who passed away a couple of years ago, three years ago. And that's what I was doing. I was just studying. I was preparing myself. I was working. And but my heart, I, I knew I had to go back to Chile. I wasn't sure where, but I knew I had to go back to Chile. And you had the benefit of being in the same church as your grandfather and grandmother, didn't you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I remember your I remember your grandfather and grandmother from the days of uh, of uh, Bethany Baptist Church in Whittier and uh, what an outstanding personal testimony and reputation they both had. Uh, the entire congregation admired them greatly. They were just they were just absolutely wonderful people. So you you have the the multiple benefit of of having been raised in 
a home of wonderful Christian parents and also being uh, having the, the benefit of being uh, close to and intimate with your grandparents, which is a wonderful thing. Oh, absolutely. And, and I was trying to gain time with them because living in the mission field, you don't get to see your grandparents. Yeah. yeah. So um, be, going to the same church, uh, hearing the stories over and over again, <laughs> it's something very special that uh, I, very, I cherish very deeply for having that opportunity. From, from the other side, uh, if, if we're talking about Christian legacy, which I think is a very important thing. I think that Christian parents are crucial, indispensable in the rearing of, of strong godly children in the future of our nation. Um, but from my mother's side, which you mentioned, my grandfather was also a, a, a pastor in the Midwest, Montana, mm -hmm. South Dakota. He was a circuit pastor. When I was younger, I thought my mother said a circus pastor, and she, he went in the circus <laughs> preaching <laughs> with different, with the clowns and everything else. And I said, well, I'll leave it there. But no, he was a circuit pastor. He would go to different churches and, and aid in, in the preaching and leading and, and, and ministry. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So um, why don't you refresh my memory on... Uh, how, when, and under what circumstances you met this lovely engineer who is now your wife. <laughs> Have you heard of eHarmony? Yes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, Good, I'm glad. That's, <laughs> that's, that's my lame joke. No, um, yeah, my wife, Carla, I met her when I was 10 years old and um, her family was family members with one of the charter members of my, my, of my dad's church. Eliezer and, and um, Ana Maria both came to know Christ. They were discipled. They were um, actually trained in different areas of ministry. And in 1996, around there, um, Eliezer's sister, which would be Carla's mother, they moved from the south up to the north where my dad had his church. And he would occasionally invite them to church. And you know how it goes when you invite somebody to church, they always have an excuse why not to go. And one time it's, they have to do laundry and then the kids are sick and then they have visitors and, and whatnot. But it got to a point where they had no more, she had no more excuse. So she knew the only way of getting rid of her brother inviting her to church was actually attending church. So to the church service at least. So they came a Sunday, a Sunday then they, came the next following Sunday and, and they started um, growing in that habit of having that hunger for spiritual things. And lo and behold, Carla's father and mother came to know Christ as their savior. Also uh, Carla and her brother and sister had a, a, a conversion story as well. And um, actually they were very, very active for a long time while my parents were ministering in that church. And I grew up with Carla being my best friend. I, I had a crush on her since I was 10 years old. And I, I started chasing after her until she stopped running away. And <laughs> that's great. That's great. Good thing happened to those who persevere. So um, I was able to convince her. And, and she had one requirement when she eventually had an attention on, on me and and she was very active in the, in, the, in the youth program. She was involved in ministry and children's teaching and, and all that sort of thing. And she said, well, I need to, I, I need to let you know that um, I will only date somebody who was called to the ministry because I know I need to be a pastor's wife. And in that one spiritual moment, the heavens were open and I felt a call to ministry. <laughs> but um, she actually she actually said that to me and God was already working in my heart before that. Now her parents uh, wanted to offer her a, a future in, that they couldn't afford, that they, did, they didn't have. So they paid for Carla to have... Um, her education, her university education, and she ended up being a, a food engineerist, which is not a glorified chef, but it's more <laughs> has to do with 
uh, nutrition, um, food engineering, administration of food companies. And it's, it's a very unique, very good. Would that, would that uh, include uh, food processing and packaging also? Absolutely. It, it's all encompassing in all the structure. And, and Chile has a, a very strong food industry. Um, I think it's number eight of the world with grapes, exportation of, of grapes. Uh, number two in the world for salmon right after Norway. 31% yeah. of, of world salmon comes from Chile, 32% comes from Norway. Um, and you have a lot of different produce, you have uh, meat industry as well. So that, that was a very promising career option for her, but she followed her, her, she obeyed her parents, she finished her education, but she knew that ministry was her call. So- Praise God. Well, you know, the, I just, I, just I, I hadn't thought about it before, but here we are on this Zoom session, uh, recording this for later release. But here I am, a 70 year old guy who's been married to a Latin woman for 45 years. And then Daniel, who is hosting this meeting in the background for us, is married to a Latin woman. And you are married to a Latin woman. That's, that might be something that a young guy ought to consider. Uh, <laughs> you, you, uh, you marry the right kind of gal and uh, life is going to be sweeter than it would be otherwise. So praise God. So tell, God us about your, tell us about your church planting ministry there in Chile with your, with your wife and daughters. All right. So as I mentioned, I, I went to Bible college. I, I graduated and I worked at a church in California. I had this necessity of, of going back to Chile because I knew the lack of churches that Chile had in comparison to the variety. There's an abundance of churches. I'm not going to say all churches are good. That's obviously not true. But if you have a limited amount of good churches in the States, you have a fewer number in the mission field. So I came here to Chile expecting to go to the city of Arica. And the city of Arica, if you look at the long country of Chile, it's the first city in the top. Five hours south, my dad, he, he, he started to work in the central part of the country and he moved up north. And in that northern um, state, He's five hours from the northern border in a, in a city called Iquique. So when I came, my mind was, I'm going to Arica, I'm going to Arica, I'm going to Arica. My father asked me, he said, you know, I, I haven't been in a furlough for a long time. And every time I go, I'm never, I never have peace because you never know what's going to happen with the pastor that you, you, you let there because people are people. And he asked me if I could oversee the church in Iquique for 10 months. During those 10 months, um, I had a, an exposure of ministry as a pastor in the state and in, in the city of Iquique. And once my dad came back, as I was preparing myself to go to Arica, th through that um, process of, of, of moving up there, we were hit with a major earthquake. It was an 8.4 magnitude earthquake and there was a lot of damage and in infrastructure people were scared we had over 400 uh, aftershocks of 5.0 and above so it was a very turbulent time people weren't uh, really um, people were scared so we decided to stay a few extra months just to help through that process of the nationals to get reacquainted and, and, and reestablished in the church in Iquique. And meanwhile, I said, I don't want to waste my time. <laughs> so I, my focus was to train a national and leave that national in the city of Altospicio. And Iquique and Altospicio are very close by. It's a, it's a 25 minute drive going up the hill. Uh, Iquique is right next to the ocean. Then you have a, a, an elevation of 500 meters. I'm not sure how many feet that would be, uh, but it's half a kilometer, like a third of a mile high. And you have another city up there, which is all the people that can't afford living down in Iquique and it's landlocked. So you have this booming city that's running, I'm not, I, I think over a hundred thousand people now with no solid good Bible preaching church. 
So my, my desire was to train one of the, the men that my dad was training in the church of Iquique, take him and plant the church with him. And then me go to the city of Arica. Long story short, he moved and took a, a church in Copiapó that was started by one of my dad's preacher boys or, or, or one of the, the ministers that my, my dad uh, trains. And that church needed a pastor because that pastor was no longer there. So Juan Carlos moved there and the, the work that we started with Juan Carlos, we ended up uh, pastoring. And we started with three families from the city of Iquique. Now we have grown with um, about 30 families that consider our church their home. They're not all members. And we have people that are in all the spectrum of barely brand new seekers, undecided, people that have uh, uh, come to Christ, people whose life have been transformed, all that spectrum we see in, in this work in Artospicio. And this move to Artospicio, we felt was what God needed us to do. If God would have told me that I was going to pastor there when I was in the States, I would have maybe said no. <laughs> Um, it was nationally known as the city of the psychopata de Artospicio, the, the psychopath of Artospicio. It was a very vulnerable city in, in the early 2000s with uh, 16 girls that were raped, killed, and hidden in the desert. So it had a very bad reputation. But because of the Iquique situation, the copper booming in all the mines, it, it started to develop. And we found that it was a very strategical move because uh, about three months ago, we started a second work or we joint efforts with the Kike church, my dad's church. He trained the national there and he sent him with six families to start a new church. It sounds like a church, but it's not. <laughs> but he sent them with six families and I sent three families from our church. And now they have a, a nucleus of nine solid families in the Northern part of the city of Iquique and once that gets established, I, my desire in the next two years is to have a second work starting out the Spicio. And I know I'll have my dad's help with, uh, with, with uh, workers and, and families. Also, this other work in Ikike that we started a couple months ago and also ours. So I, I'm very excited and I could talk hours and hours about it, but um, I'm not sure if I answered well, the question. No, that's very good. Now you're you're in an area that's intensive with mining. Is that correct? That's very very correct. Yes. Now there was a there was a movie that was made and released in the United States about some guys that were trapped in a mine for a couple of months. Uh, would that be near you or at the other end of the country or where in relation to where you are? It would be considered near when you look at the spectrum of what's near in, in Chile, uh, but it would be 13 hours away driving distance from where we're at. Gotcha. So gotcha. if you take LA to New York City, that's how long Chile is, and you add a couple mi a couple hundred miles to that. That's how long it is. But the, the, the structure of the cities in the north, our area is, you have one major city, then five hours of desert, another major city, then three hours of desert, another major city, five hours of desert. So where we're at, we are in Iquique, Alto Spicio. Then you go to Antofagasta, which is a five hour drive. And then you, the next stop is an eight hour drive to Copiapó. And that's where the mine was. And so, actually an interesting story about that is <laughs> one of the 33 miners actually attended my dad's church back in the nineties when he was living in La Serena. My dad has had some very interesting uh, people who have come across the church. And, and then there are some very fascinating stories I, I, I won't share at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if, uh, if someone, for example, when you, when you fly out of LAX, how do you get to where you live right now? What are the steps that you take flying and driving and all that kind of stuff? All right, so if, if I would be flying out of LAX, there's a couple routes. We can either go directly from LAX or from Dallas or from Miami. Those are the three main airports that go to Chile. Um, when it comes to missionary history, th this is genetical from my, from my grandfather. My grandfather was a very financially wise man. 
which led to my dad being a very financially wise man. That has led to me being a very financially wise man. Not to be, not to mention that we're very frugal. <laughs> so you have flights that could fly directly from LAX to Santiago, but growing up, I, I always remembering having a layover in Panama for 11 hours or a layover in, in Lima for 16 hours. Um, my, my, my dad actually bought the one year anniversary flight for the, the plane of Aero Peru that had uh, crashed and killed everybody. Nobody wanted to fly in that one year anniversary. And that was the best time to purchase because everything was half price. And there my dad with four, with my, with my siblings, my two brothers, my sister, myself, and my mother, uh, we had a 16 hour layover uh, in Lima. Now in the case of my wife, um, I've, I moved that one notch even, even greater. Our last time we went to the States, we took a flight from our city of Iquique to the capital of Bolivia. We skipped going through LAX we went to the capital of Bolivia because it was cheaper. Now you couldn't do that through the airline webpage. You had to do that through a, an, an agency. And we had a uh, nine hour layover at an altitude of, I think 4,300 meters. Um, that's about three kilometers high. And the altitude almost killed us. Yeah. My, 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 my middle child, she, she fainted. My lips were blue. I was dragging myself. I was the American dragging myself through the airport. And all these Bolivians walking around saying, who's this crazy guy just <laughs> can't survive the altitude? And they had to actually put uh, oxygen in, in myself and my daughters to withstand the altitude before flying because otherwise we would have been able to. Yeah, that's travel. about 13,000 feet, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I talked to a missionary one time in Bolivia and I said, I may come and see you. He said, no, you won't. And I said, why? He said, I'm at 15,000 feet and you wouldn't make it there. So it would take you, it would take you a week to become acculturated to the altitude. And so, no. So, so, so a person can fly directly to Santiago and then from there directly to your city, right? That's correct. Okay. okay. And as so you're traveling, not... you, you, you look down at the city, you have an, an extra three or four hours down to Santiago, and then you have to take another flight back four hours north. So uh, it, it, you have that mixed feeling of it's so close, yet so far away. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, the, the, the COVID restrictions um, for this last, what, eight or 10 months have been severe um what are you what are you doing by way of ministry are you uh, uh are you doing uh like remote telecasts and lots of phone calls and uh, basically uh families heads of household ministering to their families kind of thing well chile has very high restrictions but our city people don't like to follow those restrictions. Amen, amen. <laughs> but they are very, very anti, if a church opens their doors during COVID, then we are insensible and we hate people and we want people to die and go to hell and everything else. So yeah, yeah. Um, I personally, um, hopefully this will not get to the chilling authorities. I, I visit maybe four families every week. I just go through the back dirt road instead of the main paved road and everybody does it. I'm, I'm not justifying breaking the law, but we are at a point where people are in dire need of spiritual um, feeding. One of the ladies who've joined our church, um, she lost her husband due to COVID and she's 45. She's a widow with three teenage boys and it's been only through the church, through the preaching, through the reading of scriptures that she actually has a joy that she did not have before her husband died. Yeah. Um, yeah. What we're doing today, we're doing um, meetings through Meet, which is the equivalent to Zoom, but through Google. 
And um, we've actually added about nine um, regular families through it, but we have families that are only active through our church. We have a WhatsApp um, um, application in your phone and we have all of our church family there. We, we upload devotionals in the morning. We upload devotionals in the evening. Uh, we record the messages because not everybody has a good internet speed, but everybody has what's up. Not every, I would say maybe 9% of the city has a landline phone, but everybody has a cell phone and everybody has what's up. They might ha not have minutes to call somebody, but they have three minutes through WhatsApp. So that is the main communication tool. And we've gained people through it. We have families that are, uh, we've actually sent to this new work. So we've lost a few there, but um, phone calls. And it, it's it's been hard when it comes to the emotional state of people feeling lonely and enclosed and, and it, it's, it's brought a challenge, yet it, it opens their eyes to really appreciate the church. Yeah. And we had a, a open, an opening of four weeks where we could have maximum 10 people and then maximum 25 people for services with social distancing. We would pack those uh, lots up and have multiple services because people really needed and wanted to fellowship and see and visit and be fed with a live presence of the, of the word and also singing um singing hymns and praises and things of that yeah sort. yeah yeah so how has how has your without getting into specifics because that's your personal business what how, how has your support level held up over this last year um i would have to say that churches have continued we have had no loss whatsoever and we've had some extra love offerings come and 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 during the christmas time frame also we had a very very nice love offering from you and back in november and i can only attribute that to the fact that they can have programs and ministries and they have their income coming in but churches in america have not forgotten their missionaries at least not in my case so That's we're good. very joyful about that so if um, if if a if a pastor came across this video, um, and he had an interest in uh, a young missionary family that didn't have to take ten years learning the language, didn't have to take ten years learning the culture, didn't have issues with visas and stuff like that, and he decided that it just makes absolute sense to support that kind of a ministry. How would you recommend that pastor reach out to you? Well, the best way of doing it would be through uh, email. Um, email would be the fastest way to uh, reach me. My email is um, DustinReinhardt at gmail.com or my personal ministry. And this, I, I allow this only for my pastors. I have a, a, a email just for pastors because that's my... My ultimate fast track, I need to attend that immediately. And it's uh, Atacama Ministry at gmail.com. Okay, and I have that. And I'll put that underneath uh, the link to this email. If, if uh, So a pastor who sees that will, will have that access. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Well, that's great. Hey, let me, let me bring up two other things. Um, number one, I... Um, um, I sent you a copy of the book that I that I published last year, and and I have gotten yeah that's it. Um, I have gotten some feedback from um, some Spanish speaking pastors here in the USA um, who who liked it a lot, and who have urged me to to try to arrange a Spanish translation for distribution in Latin America. Um, what would be your reaction to having that as, and, and oh, by the way, there's a pastor in Florida has, has uh, spent about, I think a hundred hours developing a, um, a study guide, a study guide for leaders and for, for followers, uh, to take them through that book, because obviously that's an intense piece of work. 
Okay, it's not it's not the kind of thing somebody reads uh, at the beginning of their Christian life. Um, and I'm of the opinion I've been asking for the last year. I I I think this is a statement of fact and not intended to brag. I think it is the most comprehensive ecclesiology that has ever been printed in English. And I've been asking guys, seminary graduates and things like that, um, um, if, if they have ever encountered an English ecclesiology that is as comprehensive as this. And so far I've gotten, I've gotten no takers. Um, I would want to edit the book somewhat because there's things in the appendix which have no applicability to Latin America. Uh, but how do you think that there might be an interest? Well, well, to begin with, um, I would have to concur. This is not your easy read. Let's just skim through the pages. Um, each paragraph is a very thorough, complete thought that uh, deserves a very, very attentive mind. What I felt from the book, in my personal opinion, um, because I mentioned I, I was reading another uh, book during the same time, which was a more of a philosophical book uh, or church philosophy from a big name out there. And I'm not going to mention names. And I was reading it at the same time I was trying to read your book. <laughs> With the first one, I had illustrations and stories and whatnot, but what you have here is the equivalent of a systematic theology uh, expression of what the church is. So there's a lot of books out there that can talk about philosophy and ministry, but if you want to have theology, theology of what is the church, the ecclesiology per se, uh, this would be a book that would be worth your investment. So um, when it comes to written materials, the reason why the Latin culture is so eager to get their hands on solid books is because everything they get is just pop culture Christianity. Uh, that is their, their spectrum. They have the Joyce Myers and the Joel Osteens and... <laughs> And, um, and so on and so on. Um, so having good solid books is, is a must. And I have some good pastor friends, national pastor friends. I, I've, I've actually reached out to some of the nationals here and have established a really good relationship with them, a really good friendship. I know that in their training, there's a lot of good intentions but many times they lack the substance of why they believe what they believe. They're taught, this is what you have to preach, but they don't give you the why. If you want to have the why, <laughs> I recommend, there's, this is a very, very thorough, analytical, deep study on the topic of the church and all of its forms from its origins, at the start, and um, when it comes to, to missions, and the appendixes at the end are also of great value, my my, in my. So opinion. if I got it, if I got it translated, would you be? I and I don't. You may have time constraint issues, and so I don't want to impose on you because I realize you know this is the busiest time of your life. But <laughs> might you and your father be willing to read the Spanish manuscript? Because having read the book, you will know what my intention is, and to make sure that the. The translator, who comes highly recommended, that he really grabs the flavor and the essence of my book. Would you be willing to read that for me? Oh, absolutely. I'll take the time. And okay. then I'll, I'll go through it. And if I want to be recommending a book to friends and pastors that are in the local area, I want to make sure that it, it, it corresponds with <laughs> biblical New Testament teachings. Yeah. Yeah, good, good. Hey, let me ask you one other question. And and uh, uh, obviously, you know Daniel and his wife Mara. Um, Daniel heads up an aspect of a of a nonprofit that arranges for medical missionary teams to go to different countries. Mm -hmm. And Mara, being Panamanian, has been to Latin America a number of times. Um, What's the health care like? I know, I know Chile is, is 
just about the most advanced country in Latin America. Uh, but I found out just a surprise to me the other day is uh, that in, in Israel, for example, though they have great medical care and great doctors, they have lousy dental care. And uh, one, of the, one of the missionaries in that part of the world said he thought it would be of great benefit to him uh, to have a team come in and do dental work on people because it would improve their overall health. Um, and I'm guessing that, that these big corporations that run the mines, they probably have staff doctors uh, for their people. But I'm wondering, would there, be, uh, would there be a need or would there be a help to your ministry, perhaps your dad's ministry, other guys, uh, for a dentist to come to town for a week or two? Would it be just out of curiosity because we're dialing in here? Yeah. Um, would that be an outreach approach of come and we try to give you a gospel track sort of thing, or just as an A towards the Christians that are there, or a bridge construction towards the community? They they would do whatever you wanted to do. In other words, they would be at the disposal of the missionary and however okay. he wanted to present that to the community, uh, he could, yes. I mean, he could start out, you know, first couple of days, church members after that community. Uh, and in order to get your dental work, you're going to come to our auditorium. So that means you're, <laughs> you're in the building. Okay. Yes. People are going to be nice to you. Uh, that doesn't mean they're going to arm twist you or anything like that. Uh, but I, as you're leaving, hey, you might want to read this piece of literature on your way home. Uh, yeah. But that kind of thing. Might there be uh, an interest to discuss at, a, at another time? Uh, not on YouTube, obviously, but where, the, where you can get down to the nitty gritty and talk nuts and bolts with somebody. Absolutely. Um, I think there, there could be a space, uh, a, a need uh, when it comes to the medicine and the dental here in Chile. You have both the public and the private sector. So everybody has a public access to both medicine and dental, but the, the waiting line is very long. So when it comes to the dental, if you want to have something done and something done right, if you can afford going with the private sector, people go and do it. The prices of dental in Chile are not that far away from that in the States. And coming from a Chilean standpoint, uh, financially speaking, that's very expensive. Yeah. So, and that since I know if we would offer, let's say some uh, dental care, come and have a checkout and, or do some basic uh, help, I know we could have easily 100, 200, 500 people maybe going through there um, because of that. When it comes yeah. to, to medicine, um, I'm aware of a, of, a, of a pastor friend who does bring medical teams from the States and they've been all over the country um, helping. Yeah. But again, you have different social, social structures. So th they work in some certain areas, but they don't in others. So we would have to talk this more in, in, in detail one, one on one. But well, good. That's definitely. great. Hey, this has been a great discussion. Is there any uh, loose ends that you would like to, to tie up and make some comments before we sign off uh, so that our people, most of our people know you, a number of people who have come to Christ and become members do not know you. So I think mm -hmm. this has been a great introduction. And I would like for you, if you could, uh, to send me a, a, a late, a recent picture of the family so that when I send this out to the congregation and your link is there, they'll have you know a picture uh, with uh, you, your wife, and your and your daughters. And uh, just so absolutely, they... I'll, I'll I'll work on that. Um, you mentioned that, and it just slipped my mind with okay. with the different things. But yeah, I'll, I'll definitely get uh, pictures. Um, one last thing that we haven't mentioned that we are also involved with, and if you can keep us in your prayers. Uh, two years ago, with part of the plannings that we had with our ministry, we purchased land to develop as a Christian camp. And that is about an hour and a half away from here. And it's a bridge point with all the inland cities, I mean, towns that are up there. 
And mainly if, if you could keep that project in your prayers, as well as our ministry in Alto Spicio, uh, we put a lot of effort in planting trees and putting structures, infrastructure and everything else. Um, trees is very important. We live in the driest place in the face of the planet. <laughs> yeah. I, had a, I had a friend who asked me, looked at my prayer, my prayer card, asked me if I was a missionary to Mars because it's that barren. So we have a little area where it's a small oasis with some native trees and we're trying to plant. This is one of the trees that I'm actually um, growing here and then I'm gonna be planting up there. This is an olive tree. I have three olive trees I wanna plant up there. I have a fig tree and I just wanna give that biblical approach of, of visualizing what a lot of people in this part of the country don't really have a lot of access to, which is trees. So now if wasn't could, Chile wasn't Chile uh, the country where there was a portion of a James Bond movie where there was a hotel out in the middle of a desert? And is isn't that I think that was a that was a corporate hotel not open to the general public, but it was filmed there. And isn't that desert somewhere in your country? Well, uh, I'm Christian, so I don't watch movies. So I'm not sure about which film. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Actually, it was um, in, in, in the northern part of Chile, between here and some areas, I think, in Peru, um, that James Bond movie where it was barren, barren, just dirt and dirt and dirt. Yeah. And it's it's a shocking image when you come and visit us, when you will come and visit us, we don't have 18,000 feet of altitude, um, you will see mile after mile after mile, just dirt, sand, rocks, you have all the colors of the brown, all, all the, the rainbow <laughs> of the brown color, all the shades of brown you'll find here. But there's uh, there's some small pocket areas with some native trees, um, and that's where we actually purchase. So it, it has vegetation. We have water. We dig, we dug a, a well there. It's not a deep well, but we got some water, and and it's we're excited. It's a it's a fun project, and we've had teen outings there. We've had teen camps. In fact, this week we're planning to build our first cabin for to to try to get 20 of these teens inside we had 25 teens last year um we were expecting for this year if it weren't for COVID, to have at least 40 to 50 teens and it's a one week no cell phone no technology no outer world just fellowship love the word of god and some of the most important decisions in lives are made in camp my wife and i we we surrender our lives to ministry at a camp retreat, uh, youth retreat. So if That's you can wonderful. keep that in prayer. That's wonderful. Well, hey, let's wrap this up with a word of prayer for your ministry and, and your family um, and the work down there in, uh, in Chile, shall we? Father, we thank you for your goodness. It's a, a wonderful time we've been able to spend with Dustin and I uh, appreciate so much the opportunity that we've had, not only as a congregation to support him financially and with our prayers, but also to, to meet and to cultivate a friendship with his sweet wife. We pray also for their children and pray for the ministry down there, help them to uh, get through this COVID crisis, uh, that it can become a distant uh, and not very pleasant uh, memory. But also we're thankful that in the midst of all of this, uh, you still work in people's lives. You, the spirit of God is not restricted. Um, and, uh, and he can convict of sin and righteousness and judgment. People come to Christ, even in the midst of such things as this. So please dismiss us now with your blessing. Uh, use this video to impress upon our congregation the importance of worldwide missions and the, uh, the relationship that a congregation can have with missionaries uh, who are in places we would never be able to go on our own, that we can make Christ's name known among the nations. Blessed to that end. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless Amen. you, my brother. You have a great day, all right? Thanks thank for you giving so much. us your time.